In 2014, our goal was to educate and inspire the next generation of young black leaders. Today, we are in search of the best of the best to reveal the secrets to success. Our belief is that we should teach the young early the things that we learn late. Our lives are shifting the culture. Our lives are changing the narrative. These are the Shine Hard Conversations. He is an actor. He is uh, a creator. He is a director of an Emmy-winning digital drama series. A black director titled Giants, the series. He is also, uh, his, his series was originally featured on Issa Rae's production in her YouTube channel. It's reached over five million views. Um, you guys turn up, make some noise for my brother, Mr. James Bland. Oh man. How you feeling, man? Welcome to DC. Thank you, thank you. What's up, y'all? Y'all look good? They're all here to see you, so. <laughs> <laughs> you too, bro. <laughs> they need to see you too. Make me feel good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, man. So you know what's been on my mind? Um, the fascinating phenomenon of the overnight success. Mm -hmm. uh, because we struggle and toil underground for 10 years, and then something clicks, mm -hmm. and you become the biggest thing ever. You grow to 20 feet tall in six weeks. Yeah, yeah. And I think people connect with that when you're at your height, like, oh, I see what you're doing, your Emmy, your Google. But well, what's lost in that is kind of like where it all began. That journey. That journey, right? Yeah. So talk more about like your upbringing and what growing up was like for you. Yeah, so, hey, y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm from Titusville, Florida, small town. My best friend is in the audience, so. <laughs> yeah. The only two people from Titusville. From, from Titusville, really, really small, central Florida. Uh, I'm a graduate of Florida a and University. In the Rattlers, yeah, in the house. Yeah, so I went to FAMU and I studied business. I'm 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, somewhere around there. So, you know, as a black kid growing up in the South, uh, everybody put a basketball in my hand, and I was always pushed towards sports. And it was cool, you know, I did it. Um, you know, I was blocking shots and, uh, you know, trying to dunk on cats, but... Uh, you kind of look like Serge Ibaka <laughs> a little bit. Really, I get LeBron more. <laughs> <laughs> I get LeBron like every other day of my life. Uh, but I went to FAMU on an academic scholarship, and so I gave up sports. And uh, it kind of freed me up to figure out what else I wanted to do. I was always a creative kid. I was always writing poetry. What did you want to do as a kid? Like I when didn't you grew know, up? man. I, I, I kind of, I think I fell into the, the stereotype. I said I wanted to be a basketball player. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or I said I wanted to go to the Olympics. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be an athlete. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what was possible. Like, mm. filmmaking was never a thing. Like, when I talk to black filmmakers, even in LA, we talk about how a lot of white guys, they were making films on Super 8 cameras. Mm. You know, their parents gave them cameras. Mm -hmm. Our parents might have had a camcorder, and we couldn't play with it. <laughs> better not touch it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so the idea of making films or being a filmmaker wasn't a thing. Even the idea of being an actor, because we couldn't see it. Mm. You know, and so... Um, ability is so important. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I think I wanted to be an athlete. But once I got to FAMU... What did you uh, study at FAM? I studied business. OK. Yeah, I was a business major. So when did you decide to explore filmmaking? Yeah, so I auditioned for, uh, I auditioned for a play. Uh, and then from there, somebody told me that I could go and audition for student films okay. at Florida State. Uh -huh. So I went and audition, auditioned for a film, and that kind of opened up my mind to just filmmaking altogether. And I said, ah, oh, man, I want to do this. Like, I want to I wanna direct. I want to write. Yeah. I want to do a little bit of everything uh -huh. in front of the camera, behind the camera. And then I pledged Alpha at FAMU. Okay. So during that time, Will Packer was working on Stump the Yard. Mm. He reached out to the bros to come and step in the film. Wow. And so he then came back. So did you they, step in Stump the Yard? I did, man. I wasn't on the step team. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. coordination? So I, I, yeah. <laughs> I kind of, <laughs> I, miss, I miss my opportunity. <laughs> I missed my opportunity to be in the film, but I wasn't gonna miss my shot. You was the guy at the front of the, uh, the line yeah. that's holding up like this, so was, everybody like clearing the way. No, I was the tail. Yeah. <laughs> I was the tail dog. But I missed that opportunity, but yeah. I'm a big fan of Hamilton, but I wasn't gonna miss my shot. And so when Will Packer 
came to FAMU to premiere um, and do some marketing and some promotions, mm -hmm. you know, for the movie, I went up to him and said, hey man, I want to be a filmmaker. Nice. And he asked me if I had ever made a film and I said no. He said, go make a film and then come talk to me. Because him and Rob Hardy made their first film, Chocolate City, when they were students at FAMU. Wow. So I was like, all right, okay, I got to make a film. The, the challenge um, was set. The challenge was set. So I spent my entire senior year while serving as student body vice president writing and directing my very first film without any training. Had never been in a film class, um, had never really wrote a script. I met this uh, really talented film, filmmaker, uh, Lamont uh, Carswell. I think he goes by Lamont Pierre now. He was at Florida State. He was working on an independent series. This was before web series, before we were putting stuff up on, yeah. on YouTube. Like what year was this? Because YouTube came this out was, what, 20, This was 2005? like 2007. Okay, so YouTube was yeah. still new. Yeah, yeah, so I graduated in 2008. So I linked with Lamont, and Lamont worked with me to make my very first film. It was nice. called Dreaming in Color. And once Did you I, ever show that? Film to yeah, Will. Yeah, no, I so I premiered it uh, in the auditorium at FAMU in Lee Hall, and then I sent it to Will and was like, hey man, I made a film. Uh, I graduated, <laughs> I want to move to LA, I want to be a filmmaker. Uh, can I get an internship and opportunity? And I didn't hear from him. Mm. So I was like, man, what am I going to do? But I had that experience, and that experience solidified my desire to be a filmmaker. I knew that this was it. Yeah. You know, I realized that this was my purpose, that this is what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. So even if I had never heard back from Will, he had given matter. me the right. gift right. of realizing my purpose. Right, right. You know, and so. But you did eventually go out to LA. Yeah. So at what point did you say, okay, this is my thing. Filmmaking is gonna be my purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to LA. It was, so I premiered the film and I remember sitting in the audience watching it with a, um, with a group of people and hearing the laughs and the, the, you know, the, the tears and just the overall experience of something that I had created, I remember sitting in the seat saying, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. you know, I want this feeling over mm -hmm. and over and over again because filmmaking is my ministry. And so it was realizing that I could tell stories and really impact people in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and it became my drug in a way. I wanted to continue to feel that. Yeah. Um, and growing up, people always told me that I would be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah, <laughs> that's, that's not me. Uh, I don't want to be in a pulpit. But when I discovered filmmaking, I realized that, ah, this is, this is my pulpit. Like, this is the way God is going to use me mm -hmm. to um, impact people. Yep. Um, and so I just decided I'm just gonna move to LA. Cause so, that's what everybody does when they're yeah. trying to get into the film industry, right? Yeah. So yeah, you move to LA. Yeah. So I brought a one-way flight. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found an, an apartment to sublet, and I just moved. Um, I didn't have a job. I left my car. Yeah. You know, in Florida, and I just went. But I was in LA for, I want to say two weeks, and I got a call from Will Packer's assistant. Wow. And she said, hey, we've been getting your emails. We've been getting your calls. We're, we're, we're starting a new film, and we want to offer you an internship. Wow. And so, yeah, yeah. That's lit. And so they said, but it's going to require you to come to L.A. Mm -hmm. to, to do the internship. Like, I'm already in L.A. I was yeah. like, say less, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I'm good. already I'm here. here. <laughs> I was, what, what time? <laughs> you want me at the office? I'll be there yesterday. Yeah, I was there. So I was obedient, and I, you know, I took that leap of faith, mm -hmm. not knowing that God had already prepared the way. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that's amazing, man. That's an amazing story, just to... Yeah to reconnect with Will in LA after he had already taken that leap. Yeah. So you're working for Will Packer. I mean, where were you like? I was his intern. Picking up coffee. Yeah, I was, I was his intern on a movie called Takers. And so uh, I was the in. The intern on Takers. On Takers. <laughs> You love yeah. that movie? It was a good movie, right? It was like Idris Elba, yeah, had Chris Brown. Hella I, actors like. I had, lunch, I had lunch with Rihanna one day because Ooh. You know, she was still with Chris at the time, and so I'm just like hanging out, seeing all of these celebrities. But it was also my film school. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, the first time that I was experiencing call sheets and, and deal memos and, mm. and schedules and seeing like ADs work and gaffers and grips and learning all of these, you know, terminologies that you need when you're working, the language when you're working in the film business. Um, and I was also meeting a ton of people at the studio. And so when that internship ended, Will packed up, went back to Atlanta because he's based in Atlanta and I was still in LA and I didn't have a job. Uh. But I met enough people at the studio where I reached out to some folks and they brought me back as a production assistant on a movie called Death at a Funeral. Okay. So that was Chris Rock, that was Martin Lawrence, that was Tracy Morgan. It's a really good film. And so I was a, a PA still in the office though, mm -hmm. I was, but I was trying to get to set. 
So then I got bumped up and I became an assistant to a creative executive uh, uh, on a movie called Burlesque. Okay. And that was Christina Aguilera and that was Cher. And so that gave me the, <laughs> the on-set experience because when, they're in, when uh, we're in production, the executive is, is on set. And so I was able to you know, see the set experience. And then I got to the point where I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. Because it was becoming uh, an office job. It was becoming a desk job in a way. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm taking calls. Mm -hmm. I'm doing schedules, but I'm also doing a lot of personal things. Right. I'm getting the dry cleaning. I'm making reservations for anniversaries. Yeah. I'm buying the kids mm -hmm. birthday presents. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not what I want to do. So I took another leap, you know? And what was that? It, it was leaving Screen Gems, leaving this, this job. And I remember when I told my mom, she was like, but you say you wanted to move to LA to make movies. Aren't you making movies? Mm -hmm. Like you have a job, you're, you're at a studio. I was going to the premieres. I, was, I had the ability to say I had worked with this person mm -hmm. and that person. Yeah. Who, but who was saying that? Even, folks? even my mom, yeah, yeah. you know, my mom was like still kind of confused because She's like you made uh, it or you got a good job, right, right. like stick it out, like stay there. But that's the mentality of our parents, right? Of that generation It's like you find a good company and you stay there. You work there for years and you get them benefits and you're working <laughs> in the business, right? Uh, but I was like. This ain't the dream, nah, it's you know? Not. Yeah, it's this different. isn't it. Like, I was in the office and I would see writers and directors and actors come in and have these meetings and to talk about things that they had birthed. And I was like, I ain't birthed nothing. Mm. You know, I'm sitting here uh, helping someone else's vision, you know, come to life. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta birth something. I need some children. Mm -hmm. You know, I like how Ava DuVernay, she calls all of her films her kids. And I was like, I need some kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Be careful you know, what because, you wish for, brother. Because that's, I got one. But that, because that's legacy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's a lot of work, and you know that. Yeah. That once you get children, you got to care for them. Mm -hmm. You got to feed them. Mm -hmm. You know, they eat up your money. Oh. But, but that's yeah. also legacy. Wake you up at night. Right. Right. And so uh, I decided to, to leave Screen Gems and... Um, just made the decision to take the leap of faith. So you started, start creating so you started your content. own thing. So what was the first thing you birthed? Because it, it wasn't Giants. It wasn't Giants. So the first uh, project was a web series called Fail. It was a comedy about seven uh, college students who formed a study, no, five, five college students who formed a study group to pass a class that they never ended up studying mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. So your first project was called Fail? Yep. What was your budget for that project? Because I know for me, when I started Shower Conversations, I had no money, just a bunch mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. And I had to barter my ass off just to get people to work with me to yeah. grow the platform. Like, mm -hmm. what was your budget and how did you finance your first big project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shot two episodes for $3,000. And it came from my parents. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So what was your plan to see a return on that investment? Did, did you want to monetize that content or like? Yeah. So we had a meeting that? at we had a meeting at BET, and we went and we pitched the show to BET with the hopes of it becoming a BET digital series. And BET said if you go and you create a whole season, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you know, we'll acquire it. Maybe yeah. we'll pick it up. So we were hyped. We were like, okay, we're gonna go. We're we gonna need thirty thousand dollars, and we're gonna uh, have the show on BT. And so, um, I created the show with Vanessa Baden Kelly, who also plays Journey and Giants. Uh, so Vanessa and I, we met uh, in Tallahassee. She went to Florida State. I went to FAMU. And so Vanessa and I decided that we needed to get more viewership on our episodes that were already up on YouTube. So we planned a makeshift college tour. Mm. We literally flew to Florida. Uh, I had got in a car accident um, and I needed to get a new car. So I was getting a new car in Florida and then we made the plan to literally drive across the state of Florida to start in Miami to hit every college and university. And this was we, like your marketing strategy. Yeah, to because some grassroots. Yeah, because at that time we were relying solely on Facebook. We didn't have Instagram. Twitter wasn't really popping like that. Right. But we knew that if we were going to get the word out, you couldn't rely solely on Facebook. And what One year of was our this? Approximately. This was twenty around twenty eleven. Okay. Yeah, around yeah. 2011. And so we were in Florida and my computer crashed. And so we went to a Best Buy to the, to the Geek Squad to get it fixed and play. Uh, Christopher Martin from Kid and Play happened to be in line. And <laughs> what? <laughs> right. And so 
And so Play had saw a short film that I wrote and directed called Coco Love. Yeah. It was my very first film. It was about a dog funeral. Um, and <laughs> Play had saw this short. He remembered me. And he was like, what are you doing now? Uh, and I said, oh, I'm actually on a tour promoting a web series that I created. Yeah. And I had a flyer. And uh -huh. I gave it to him. I was like, check it out. Okay. So he went and checked it out, and he called me the next day, and he said, hey, I want to meet with you. And we met Play at an Olive Garden. <laughs> and went and talked, had, a, had this meeting with Play, and Play signed on to be an executive producer of the show. And he invested uh, in the series so we could go and shoot our second season. Wow. Yeah. And still, God. nobody really saw it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we had play behind us. Uh, it ended up being And BET on. never picked it up. BET never picked they it flaked. up. They flaked. Oh, man. Yeah, we went into BET. We showed this content, and they passed. Mm. Um, play had a lot of connections. We even went all the way to New York to Stephen Hill's office. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. still a pass. Um, and they thought the content was going to be closer to like a house party. The content was kind of clean. Um, it, was, it definitely wasn't a giant, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in terms of the things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, it, and it just wasn't a fit. It just wasn't its time. But because I did fail, that's how I met Issa Rae. Uh. So I had fail. I put fail out. And I had a, a friend in L.A. Her name is Jamila Webb. And she was looking to start her own web series. And so she reached out and she said, hey, will you come over? Uh, me and my roommates, we want to do our own show. We want to pick your brain. And I'm also going to invite this girl that I went to college with. They mm -hmm. went to Stanford. And I was like, all right, cool. Because around this time, she was just getting started with the Awkward Black Girl yeah. on YouTube, and right? And so Issa had just launched The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl. And I want to say she had like two episodes up. Mm -hmm. And so we met at a friend's house, and uh, we kind of shared our experience. Yeah. And then from there, we were like, okay, let's support each other. Like, I'll post you know, your episode on my Facebook page. Okay. You post mine on your Facebook page. And if you need anything, like, holla. Yeah. And she took off. <laughs> like, she blew up. Um, but because I did fail, even though fail didn't take off, it was a seed. You know, and it's how I met Issa, and then I want to say five to six years later, I then ended up putting Giants on her channel. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So I guess I want to talk more about Giants. I watched it, I watched a couple episodes this weekend, mm -hmm. um, and I was impressed. I think you touched on a lot of very authentic and relatable topics to mm -hmm. black millennials. Um, tell us more about what... Giants is really about and mm -hmm. the inspiration behind creating it. Yeah, so Giants is a coming of adulthood drama series that follows three millennials of color as they navigate through life. They're living in LA, chasing more than dreams, and they're dealing with issues of sexual identity, uh, mental health, and just overall identity and mm. finding your purpose mm. and just figuring out how to survive uh, economic uh, stability. Mm. Um, so how do you pay the rent when you're chasing a dream and the dream isn't paying off? Yeah. Um, and so the inspiration behind the show was I was in, I was in a place of realizing that I, everything that I had been creating prior to Giants, I felt like I was creating for Hollywood. Mm. I was trying to find a project that was going to take off. I was thinking about uh, what was already in the market and trying to duplicate, you know, things that I thought was going to be successful. Mm. And when I when I, when, I, when I created Giants, I had reached this place where I just wanted to be authentic. Yeah. I just wanted to bear myself. I just wanted to say something that really mattered. Right. And I was in this, this place of what is my legacy you know, going to be? And if I was to leave this earth tomorrow, like, what did you say? Yeah. Did they know you existed? Mm -hmm. Did they know what your experience was? It's like this quote from Zora Neale Hurston that says, if you're silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Mm. And so, yeah, I was just, I was in a place, y'all, you know? Yeah. Um, so you just got in your bag as got, an artist. So I got, I really yeah. got in my bag and initially Giants started as a gym. Yeah. I was in LA, I was a writer, I was a director, I was an actor, I was a producer, and everybody was telling me you can't be all of these things, right? They were like, choose a lane. And I was trying to choose a lane. I was trying to just be an actor. Mm. But I wasn't booking. Mm. Vanessa was an actor. She grew up on television. She was on Nickelodeon. She was on Gullah Gullah Island and Kenan and Kale. She had moved back to LA. Shout she, out to my 90s babies. Yeah. yeah. Come on. And she wasn't booking. Yeah. And so it's a conundrum. You want to be an actor, but if you don't book, you're not getting the opportunity to act. Right. 
right? And so you're forced to be a writer mm. because you have to create You have your to create content, something, right, right? right? And so I sat down and wrote Giants. But then um, if you want to see it uh, actually exist on a screen, you got to be a producer yeah. because you got to produce it. And so then oftentimes you also got to direct it. Why did you decide to use YouTube as your digital platform to publish your content? I mean, YouTube creates a community. Um, and if you want eyeballs, like YouTube is the place to go. I think also uh, YouTube provides a user experience where we go to YouTube with the expectation to watch long form content. Mm. We go to Instagram to swipe. We want to swipe, we want to double click, and we want to keep it moving. Yeah. We go to Facebook to almost do the same thing. We want to look at articles. We want to watch videos, but we want to watch short form videos. Yeah. I think YouTube is a, is a space where we go to sit down and we're prepared to watch a 10 minute, maybe 20 minute video if it's, you know, if yeah, it's that. It's and then in addition, it's an opportunity for people to discover your content. Mm -hmm. I always like to ask people, you know, how did you hear about Giants? And oftentimes folks say it came up in their suggested, mm -hmm. you know, feed. Yeah. And so I think YouTube is just a really great place to foster a community around your content. Nice, yeah. yeah. And when I sit down with like talented creators and influencers, um, you guys inspire thousands and some millions in, in the work that you do, mm -hmm. but I'm always fascinated to understand like who inspires the influencers. Mm -hmm. So if you had like to name two or three people, who would be on your Mount Rushmore of inspiration? Oh, uh, Issa Rae, for sure. Like Issa was such a model mm -hmm. in terms of how do you go from the web to fucking HBO? <laughs> 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 or, you know, how do you turn a digital series into a brand? And so I saw what she did with Aqua Black Girl, and Aqua Black Girl was more than just a digital series. It became a book. It became a speaking tour, you know, at colleges. Uh, it became merchandise. It became and a so community, because a lot of Aqua became, Black Girls yeah, in this world. It became a community. Some of y'all in here, too. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, and because of that, you guys continue to watch, you know, Issa Rae content because now you're a fan of the Issa Rae brand, mm -hmm. right? And so Issa was probably one of my biggest inspirations in terms of where do I go, you know, from having a successful digital series to figuring out how to leverage it where I always looked at Giants as the brand. Mm -hmm. Like even if you go to my Instagram, my bio is a giant among men. Mm -hmm. Like everything is about being the giant, like I am the giant, right? What's also on your Instagram is you're doing the Jordan pose butt naked like this. That too. <laughs> that too. Go to Jay's yeah, yeah. Instagram right now and laugh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a giant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's a part of the brand. Yeah. That's what's um, up, man. But I will also say Spike. Yeah, Spike Lee, because yeah. Spike for me was the first example of a filmmaker who wore many hats. Mm -hmm. He was a writer, he was a director, but he was also an actor. Like, Spike was in every single one of his films in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I saw Spike do it, yeah. and he did it well, and he did it for the culture. Yeah. Um, and I would say um, the third person, I'm a big uh, Ryan Coogler fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when I look at, also Ryan Coogler and Nate Parker, because uh, Nate was always so specific in the roles that he played, mm. and it was always roles that uplifted the community. Yeah. Um, and so I've also adopted that even now that I'm going out and I'm auditioning. I'm just very specific about just not wanting to be an actor for um, the sake of entertainment. Yeah. But everything that I do from writing, directing, um, and acting, it has to have a greater purpose. Right, right, it right. has to uplift us, it has to tell our stories, and it has to speak to like a greater cause. Right, for the culture. Yeah. And I, from a black filmmaker perspective, right now I'm really feeling Ava DuVernay and mm -hmm. Jordan Peele. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and from a Shine Heart perspective, one mantra that we commonly say is passion changes everything, mm -hmm. because we believe that when you find your passion, it would bring you closer to your purpose in life. Uh, it's very clear that you've identify what that purpose is for you, but mm -hmm. more specifically, what would you say is your passion? And when did you know? Yeah. My passion is storytelling. And I would say I knew pretty early. Like I was that kid that would put on talent shows mm. at like seven years old. Um, I was a kid where poetry was my talent. And so, you know, when you gotta do something for church, and they're like, what you gonna do? You gonna sing? <laughs> you gonna do a praise dance? <laughs> like, 
what you gonna do? <laughs> or at the at the family reunion? Yeah. <laughs> What's your talent, baby? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My talent was always I'm gonna do a poem. Uh -huh. um, but that was storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think I, I, I learned really early, but it wasn't until I got to FAMU that I realized I wanted to do it for a living mm. and that I realized that I could make a living from being a storyteller. Yeah. So as being a storyteller, what's been the biggest challenge for you as a black filmmaker in this industry? I would say getting found in the crowd. Mm. It's pretty it, fucking crowded. Is it oversaturated? Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, you know, I, well, I don't want to say it's oversaturated. I think it can be hard to break through. Mm. Like I used to have this fear that what if I put all of this energy in the Giants and I put it out and nobody cared, like nobody watched it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I think sometimes when you look at social media, uh, there's just so much content. We got Netflix, we got Hulu. So much content. You know, BT is coming out with a uh, with a digital platform. Mm -hmm. You got Clio. You got TV One. You got Zeus. You got uh, Crackle. You got own. It's just so yeah. many places for us to consume content that um, it can often become a real challenge to kind of wrangle an audience. Yeah. Because how does a content creator break through the noise? How do you stand out? Or is be it authentic. Just, yeah. Yeah. Find your voice mm -hmm. and be okay with having a niche audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think everybody's trying to have this mass appeal, mm -hmm. but if you just find your tribe. If you speak to, it's like, it's like a business, like speak to your client, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, speak to the folks who want to hear from you, yep. um, and eventually you will cross over. Yep, yep. Start yeah. where you are uh, with what you have. Yeah. Start that community and let that grow. Mm -hmm. Find a loyal base. Yeah. You know, find the awkward black girls and get the awkward black girls to rally around you. Mm -hmm. And then eventually maybe the, the confident black girls <laughs> will be like, hey, we see y'all. And then eventually, <laughs> Eventually, the white girls will be like, we want to be on right. too, we you know? Out. We woke too, yeah, yeah. what you mean? For sure. Yeah. So you, you find a solid, loyal base, and you continue to speak to them, and you never forget about them, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You yeah. never forget about the folks who rode with you, uh, who was down, mm -hmm. you know, when nobody knew about you, when you yeah. were putting out mixtapes. You never forget about your core yeah. audience, and you're always loyal to them. However, um, you do have to evolve, mm -hmm. you know, as well. Yeah. So I believe everyone in here has an ambition. By the fact of them even being here, they're driven towards some endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like everybody has a dream? I would say so, yeah. So what separates the people from who make their dream a reality and the people who don't? Uh, I think the folks who don't get paralyzed by fear. Mm. Yeah. Fear? Yeah. So that's just... I mean, that's being the afraid thing. to start, I, I think, being afraid to I try. I think fear is the thing that prevents uh, so many people from living their dream, mm -hmm. or fear is also the thing that keeps people in a place of comfort. Um, it's an uncomfortable place, man, yeah. to, to kind of live uh, in, this, in this unknown, yeah. to be an entrepreneur, uh, to not have stability, yeah. um, to be in this place of taking a shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and constantly having to learn. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you are at the cutting edge of your purpose in your life, you're always faced with new challenges and things that you have to relearn. Yeah. Like you're giving a plow you're giving a new platform. Now you have to learn how to be mm -hmm. the person that that platform needs you to be. Mm -hmm. um, just like for me, having this Google platform is like, yes, I was a social entrepreneur, but now with this profile, I have to become this digital coach. I have to become a digital expert. I have to mm -hmm. become a resource to so many new people that it's a challenge. It's yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. It's like, man, I'm overwhelmed, but mm -hmm. this is who I've been called to be. Mm -hmm. So I definitely understand like that fear um, and the self-doubt that yeah. comes along with that. Like, am I worthy of this? Yeah, because I think we all have asked ourselves, like, what if it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. You know, or what if I'm not one of the chosen ones. <laughs> like I used to kind of have that fear. Like people would tell you when you move to LA, like only a very small percentage of people, quote unquote, make it. Yeah. And initially, when you get there, you're like, oh, I'm gonna make it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be one of the ones. Yeah. And then five years go by, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, Ten years go by, and then you really start to question, is this for me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or God, did I hear you correctly? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think being able to uh, confront fear, but also being consistent. Yeah, And 
Um, one of my favorite poems is If, and there's a line that says, if you can wait and not grow tired of waiting. Mm. I think that's also important mm. too, because yeah. it's like Ubeku 2 and 3 says, a vision waits on a point in time, and mm. it will linger. Like, it will, y'all. Yeah. I've been in LA for 10 years, and I feel like really my career is just starting. Like, Giants is my sixth series. I watch so many people get their shot, get their opportunity. I watch Issa Rae, like Lena Waif was one of the, the, the first people that I met when I got to LA. Um, and you can, in particular with social media and with Instagram, we can get in the cycle of watching other people get their opportunity. Well, we all want that instant you know, gratification, right? Get their right? turn, yeah. you know what I mean? And so it's really easy to uh, feel like you've been forgotten, mm. you know what I mean? And so I think the key is being consistent and continuing to believe that your that sh that your chance that your your day you're chosen day, you are the one that your day I will think come. even though there's a percentage of people who won't who won't be the one you have to have the mentality of like I'm gonna go to the top of the mountain mm -hmm. either gonna see me waving from the t waving from the top mm -hmm. or dead on the side I'm not coming back yeah I believe that there's some content creators in the building right now what advice do you have for how we can create and master the art of storytelling. Uh, what's the mindset and what's like the steps that we have to take in order to, to get to that point? Yeah, so the webinar is called Creating a Giant and I kind of walk through the steps from story um, to production to uh, marketing, you know, distribution uh, of a digital series. Uh, story is king, like that's first and foremost. If you want to be a content creator, your story has to be tight. And so put a lot of time, attention and focus on your story. Um, it should be authentic. Mm -hmm. um, it should uh, it should be relatable, um, and I think all good stories are universal. And so, even if it's a story that's specific to your experience, to your sexuality, to where you grew up, um, it's kind of like you can watch a film like Lion, which is about a a, a little boy in India, mm -hmm. and we can still relate to that story. Or we can watch a story about kids in y Uganda, or like one of my favorite films is, is City of Gods, and it's these kids in Brazil. And so know that even if you can't specifically relate to what they're going through, great stories are universal. So story is king. So that's like number one, get your story tight. Focus on the story, uh, know your structure. Uh, all good stories have an arc, so know where you're starting and know where you're ending. Mm. So that's number one. Uh, let's see, number two, production. Build the team, right? I think Issa Rae said network across. Mm. I think oftentimes we're trying to, you know, go for the top. We're trying to hit up, you know, folks in our industry that we feel like are going to put us on. Like, put each other on. Mm. Like, let's put, you know, let's, let's get together, let's link arms, and let's create something that's undeniable mm -hmm. where eventually the folks at the top have no choice but to notice us. So, build a team. So, I kind of talk about that and the ways you can do that. Um, within uh, the film space. Like, Y'all writing this down? These are gems. Yeah. All right, making sure. So, like, you know, I, I use Craigslist a lot, actually, uh, to crew a lot of my projects. Upwork is the plug. Mm -hmm. When I tell you I've gotten websites, I had a guy in Ubekistan uh, designing a website for me. So for the, the low. The, for the low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, our, the dollar goes so far in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so really utilize Upwork. Um, there's a lot of quality, you know, skilled folks. And so I've gotten a lot of my VFX work done. I've gotten, like, the, the posters for Giants, you know, done on Upwork. Like I said, a whole website. Yeah. So build a team. And then um, my third thing kind of goes into like the distribution and the marketing, but uh, I'm gonna just slide this in. Yeah. Uh, be very intentional about your why, like know your why. And I think this applies to everybody, whether you're creating a digital series or you're creating a company, like get very centered in the purpose and your intention behind your attention. Because whenever you know things get shaky or when things aren't taken off right away, if you can get back to your why, like why did I do this, or why am I doing, or why did I start this, and why am I doing this, that is gonna be the thing that's gonna, uh, that's gonna plant you. Mm. Um, and when you feel like you're veering off course, come back to the why, like why did I start this in the first place? Um, a good example is like, I wrote, no I didn't write, I directed a short film starring Will Catlett. Will Catlett's an actor, he was in A Love Is, but Will and I started working together on a web series called First. He was also, okay, we got a, we got a fan right here. Come on. Yeah, so before there was a Yasir, there was a Charlie, right, in First. Yeah, and so Will and I did this short film. It's a silent short called Stages. You can actually watch it. Thank you. You can, 
you can watch it on, on Issa Rae's YouTube channel. And we submitted that film to every single film festival. Mm. Sundance, Tribeca, AFI, uh, Toronto, you know, Cannes. We didn't get into one festival. ABFF, you know, uh, the black festivals. And we was like, damn. <laughs> like, we thought we had made a ain't good nobody film. Rocking like, with ain't us. Like, ain't nobody fucking with us. And we felt like we made a really solid film. I'm like, Will, I think you're a pretty good actor, bro. Mm. Like, you're the next Denzel. I'm an okay director. Like, I think we did a decent job. And we were, we were kind of shook. Like, like, you know, we didn't get into any festivals. And so we had to come back to our why. Yeah. And I was like, Will, why did we do this film? And Will and I both agreed we did it because we wanted to help people. Like, we wanted people to see this and, and, and be healed in some type of mm, way. Mm. And so we were both like, do we need a film festival? to achieve that. Mm. And we were like, no. So we were like, why are we putting so much weight on festivals? Like, we can put this out on YouTube and maybe reach more people. You can distribute it on your own. And so I hit Issa and was like, yo, let me put this up on the channel. <laughs> 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 and she was like, yeah. And that's how they started the short film Sundays. That's it. Like, Stages was the first short and, you know, it performed well. And so get really clear on your why because you'll set some goals and you'll have these ideas of things that you want to do and achieve. And when they don't happen, you come back to your why and sometimes it'll help you recalibrate. Mm -hmm. You can re-navigate. You can realize, oh, I didn't even need that in the first place. You know what that sounds like? Find a way to serve many people. Yeah. Hey, bro, I appreciate the conversation, man. Authentic, yeah. insightful, bro. I appreciate sure. you, brother. Thank you, man. Yeah, I give a round of applause for Mr. James Blair. Here are three ways you can support. One, visit our website. Continue to watch and share our collection of Shine Hard Conversations. Two, register for our annual conference, the Shine Hard Summit. Three, make a donation. With your support, we can provide access to spaces, access to information, and access to capital for the next generation of young black leaders.